Welcome to Northland. We're here at the Heart Conference, and it's an honor to have Dr. Tom Schreiner of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Thanks for coming. That's great to be here. Yeah, it's 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 a privilege to have you here, and I just have a bunch of questions for you. I'd love for you to share. Um, you've you've probably written more books than I've read, but um, <laughs> it's I doubt that. Yeah, okay, so, maybe not. Yeah. But um, I'm very thankful for how God has gifted you and how you've used those gifts for the sake of the church, for the sake of the kingdom. And so looking forward to having you come here and actually speak tonight to us in the evening session and look forward to that. Um, you, you're known especially to so many people by the commentaries that you have written. I know you're a teacher as well. Could you share with us, share with me, um, your, your heart behind being a writer of commentaries uh, the purpose of those commentaries for the church, for pastors, for preachers. Yeah, I, I think I think the use of commentaries by lay people and pastors. I, th I think it. I think people respond to them differently. In other words, I don't think there's just one pattern. Some people will read a commentary right away, mm -hmm. right off. Others say they do all their study and then look at a commentary. I, I don't agree with those who say, well, there's just one right way to do it. So I think, I think it's largely kind of understanding yourself. I mean, finally, the biblical text should rule, not a commentary. But, but none of us come to a text with a blank slate anyway. If we think we really come to a text with a blank slate, we're, we're just wrong. We, we all have presuppositions. We all have ways of thinking about texts. We all have a theology already. So if it works well for you to look at a commentary first and kind of get a, the lay of the land, I, th I think that's helpful. For other people, and actually I work the other way, I like to analyze a text first and then go to a commentary. Pe but, but, but I don't think there's just one right way, but I think the function of a commentary for a pastor or you're teaching a Bible study or even just personal individual study it, is to help you see things that maybe you didn't see when you were studying. You, perhaps you're not aware of what this particular verse means, or, or maybe there's a debate on, on something that you just weren't aware of, and so it introduces you to that. It's, and then you interact with it. You, you, you think, is, is that what the text is really saying? So, so hopefully the commentary stimulates you intellectually, but also spiritually, because you hopefully will see things in the text that you, you, you didn't see or wouldn't have seen uh, without the commentary. But then there's all kinds of commentaries, aren't there? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a very brief commentary. You know, sometimes those are the most helpful. I, I've actually found in preaching, sometimes I've been helped most by the ESV study Bible. <laughs> it's brief and to the point, and it gives me what I want. And sometimes the very technical commentary is, is not as helpful. But then there are other occasions where I want, I want to look at something more technical and the word biblical commentary or the Baker commentary or whatever I'm looking at is, is really helpful as well. Yeah, thank you. While we're still on the subject, is there any commentary that you're working on right now? Any volume of the Bible that you're currently in wor working on? Yeah, I just, finished, I just finished writing a commentary on the Epistle to the Hebrews. And it's a new series coming out from Broadman and Holman which uh, is a commentary, but it also looks at the biblical theology of, uh, of, of each book of the Bible. So no volumes are out yet in that series, but I'm excited about it because I, I think it's helpful for us to think not just of the chapters and verses, but, but what's the author saying as a whole, and it's, it's hmm. written for pastors, and I think it's gonna be accessible, and so That's I'm great. excited about that. You know when that's coming out? 2015, Lord willing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it'll Great. be a while. Great, yeah. yeah. Well, um, being a teacher and you're also a pastor, uh, writer, uh, especially in with with Bible right at the center. I know that you have a you love the Word of God, not just to analyze the Word of God, but to know the Word of God, to to live the Word of God, to obey the Word of God, and let others know and love the Word of God. Uh, with that, um, we're a Bible college. We're a, we're a school wanting to train our students to love the Word of God. How would you commend people to, 
How would you commend our students? How would you commend churches to, to, to truly take the Word of God so seriously in their, in their daily life and practice? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'd just say something personal here. Yeah. I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and when I was 17, for the first time, I read the Bible for myself. And, and God used a number of things, including the person who's now my wife, to bring me to Christ. But what played a major role was my reading of the Bible for the first time and the power and the beauty of Scripture. Uh, I mean, the Holy Spirit was working, right? But it struck me and it, 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 it brought me to Christ. So uh, I think if, if we've been a Christian for a long time, if we've heard the word many times, we can, we, we can forget, we can wander, we can even read the Bible, right, and not experience what's there. But there is a power and a, and, and a strength and a beauty in the biblical text, and it's transforming. And, and of course, that's yeah. what the Bible says. You know, Jesus mm -hmm. says, my words are, are spirit and life. Yeah. And, and there are so many texts on the transforming power of the Bible. So that's what the evangelical movement is all about. That's what the Reformation was about. That's what every revival in a church has been about. It's always been about the Bible. Yeah. The Bible has been front and center because, not because we worship the Bible, but because the Bible tells us and communicates to us who God is and who Jesus Christ is. So, mm -hmm. so it, it isn't about worshiping a book, mm -hmm. but, but the Bible, this Holy Spirit uses the Bible to bring us into a, personal contact mm. with the living God. So the, the words are living mm. because they communicate who God is to yeah. us. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's very helpful. Central to the Bible is, is the gospel. And Justin Taylor was with us last night and he spoke on John Owen and killing sin. Mm. And mm. central to that is the gospel. And he, and he so helpfully gave us a picture that that the gospel must be in our lives, not just the door into a room. And we just love that door. And to get in that room that you really want to be in, you, you got to go through that door and it's great. You look back and say, that's a great door. But the gospel is much more than that. It's the foundation of that room. It's the pillars of that room. It's the air that we breathe in that room. It's the gospel. Could you, could you speak a little bit more about that and in regards to the, even just the phrase that's often been used, gospel-centered? And, and even, what is that gospel? Oh, oh. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with what Justin said. The gospel, the gospel is central. I, I think I'd go back to Luther who said, we have to relearn the gospel every day. So, so what, what's contrary to the gospel? What is it fundamentally that's contrary to it? Well, human sin, of course, but how does that show up in us as Christians? Well, it shows up as pride, it, and, 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 and what does that mean? That means that we begin to trust in ourselves and to boast in ourselves and rely upon ourselves and, 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 and to worship ourselves. So that's the temptation we face every day. Everything we do in life is we're judged by our works. So how are we doing? How are things going? we're always being assessed and evaluated. In one sense, that's right, isn't it? I mean, that, that's what I do with students, right? I assess them, how are you doing on your grades? But, so, and, and that's true in our work, that's true in that, just everything we do. So every, everything in life screams at us constantly to be evaluated in terms of our performance. Not necessarily wrong in and of itself, but it can easily lead us in our daily walk with the Lord to stray from the gospel so that we can say in our heads, oh yes, we're trusting in Jesus for our salvation. But just as you said, it can be, and that happened 35 years ago or whenever, 10 years mm -hmm. ago. And, and actually in our daily lives now, we're not relying mm -hmm. on the grace of God and trusting on the grace, in the grace of God mm -hmm. for, for our sanctification. For our, for our yeah. for our daily walk with the Lord, so that so that if if we're easily getting hurt, I mean this shows up in every area. If we're easily wounded and hurt and upset, those those are all signs 
that we're not trusting actually in the gospel, that we're living for our own reputation. So I think it shows itself in just um, in, in so many ways. What is the gospel fundamentally? I think the gospel fundamentally is that our righteousness doesn't lie in ourselves. The right, our righteousness lies in Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished for us. So we don't look to what we've done finally, but what Jesus crucified and risen is for us. I think that's fundamentally the gospel. Praise God. Northland is a college preparing the next generation of servant leaders. We, we say it this way, we want to prepare the next generation of servant leaders for great commission living. Um, what advice would you give to college students, those that are going to be college students soon, those that are getting close to finishing college, as they look and as they're, they're preparing for a life of following Jesus, wherever he leads, whatever it costs, what advice would you give them? Yeah, well, I, I think first of those who are in, in college who are, who are studying scripture, because we've talked even in these questions quite a bit about the transforming effect of the gospel, and yeah. of course that's vital. But, I, but I'd want to say an, another thing here, and that is the importance of, of get, gaining a theology, uh, of, of knowing truth. Uh, so, so the practical and the theological, it's just vital if you're going to be in ministry, whether you're on the mission field, which I have a son right now in Nairobi, whether you're on the mission field or whether you're a pastor, wherever you are, it's vital that the practical is informed by the theological because if the, the theological is practical. So uh, the first thing I'd say to a student, what you're doing in these classes, it matters. It's significant. It, it, it makes a difference. If, if, you're, if you're not seeing how it makes a difference, press your teachers so that they can help explain that to you because, mm -hmm. because it, makes a, it makes a huge difference. I, I'll just give you one example from my own life. I was taught a theology of sanctification when I was first a Christian that was not in accord with scripture. So when I came to seminary and I was taught that sanctification is slow and progressive, it changed my life. It, I, it, I understood I understood what God intended of me and I understood my faults better, but I also understood what he called me to do in a more uh, profound way. So, so I would wanna say what you're doing in college, because I think, I think it's easy for passion to, uh, for passion to be so great that, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. to be passionate. So that I'm assuming that here, yeah. given yeah. previous questions. You, you have a passion for Christ. You have a passion for the gospel. You have a passion to see others transformed. But the foundation has to be truth. Because yeah. passion without truth yeah. leads to fanaticism. Mm -hmm. Of course, truth without passion lead, is dry, legalistic. So, you, so we need both. Right. But while you're in school, it's important. Church history is important. We, we learn so much from those who've gone before us, their, their virtues, John Owen, and their mistakes. We, we can learn from that. Yeah. Thank you. Touching on one of the subjects you just brought of theology that, that made a difference in your life, makes a difference in our lives, and it fits with the theme of the Heart Conference this year is the holiness of God, and that the subject of sanctification. I believe you wrote a book or co-authored a book, um, Race Set Before Me, yes. um, on, on sanctification. How does, share your heart behind that. What do, what do we need to know in regards to the, the, the practical theology side of sanctification for our lives? Well, there, there's so much. I'll just take out one little yeah. strand here. The one strand I, I take out is that I think some those of us in our theological tradition who rightly teach that all those who belong to God will make it to the end, mm -hmm. sometimes said once saved, always saved. Yeah. I think that statement is true, yeah. but that statement can be abused. So mm -hmm. yes, once we're saved, we're always saved, but the scriptures also call us to persevere in faith. Mm -hmm. The scriptures don't call us to persevere in works fundamentally, mm -hmm but to persevere in faith. So it's, it, it's a good guard against this yeah. notion of someone saying, you know, I'm saved because I, yeah. I, I got baptized when I was 10. 
I, I went forward. Asked Jesus in my heart. I, I prayed with my grandmother or, or mom yeah. or dad, but I haven't been to church for 10 or 15 years, and I'm, uh, there's no evidence that person is following the Lord now. Uh, but that's not biblically what we're taught about sanctification or salvation. So yeah. Sanctification means not, not that we're perfect, hmm. not that we don't sin, not, not there may even be significant lapses. You think of David, mm -hmm. that's a significant lapse. Yeah. Or you think of Peter denying the Lord. So there may be significant lapses in our lives, but at the end of the day, we persevere. We continue to trust and, and out of that trust comes, comes obedience. Mm -hmm. James said, one of my favorite verses, we all stumble in many ways. So mm -hmm. it's the same James who said, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is, is idle and nothing. But he also said we all stumble in many ways. So we're not talking about perfection. We all stumble, sin in many ways. James including himself there. Mm -hmm. So the, when he says faith without works is dead, he's, he's not talking about perfection, is he? Yeah. he? But he is saying there's a new direction in our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I realize what I just said could be misunderstood. This is not a self-righteousness. This is relying on God and Jesus Christ. This is trusting Him. That's the, but the trust mm -hmm. expresses itself in a certain way. It expresses itself in a, in a, in a glad perseverance, not a perfect perseverance. The, the faith that perseveres, where does that faith come from? Well, it absolutely comes from God. Yeah, He began a good work in you, will complete it until yeah. the day of Christ Jesus. So we have that confidence. Yeah. On the one hand, we're called upon to persevere. Yeah. And that on the other hand, we're promised God will give us the grace to persevere. So it's this we are to persevere knowing that He is at work in us to do that, yet we're called to go after it, run after the prize, go after Christ, keep keep on keeping on, knowing that he is under us and in us and through us. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. that, it's an interesting tension, isn't it? Because yeah. we have that assurance. We yeah. have that assurance we'll make it to the yeah. end. Yeah. And uh, But at the same time, we're called upon, as you said, to yeah. run the race. Yeah. yeah. Well, you are, you have many hats. You're, you're a teacher uh, in a seminary. You write, you are a pastor and preacher. At Clifton, you are a father of mostly grown-up kids now, yep, and yep. and grand grandfather. The yeah. oldest is four Sunday. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, and with with there's a couple on the way. Yeah, so exactly. It's exactly. Exciting. Yeah. Um, what is your heart for being a pastor as well, a pastor theologian? What's your heart for pastors? What's your heart for the church and that pastors? Yet we want to train pastors. We want to minister to pastors. What's your heart for them? Yeah, yeah I think that as some of the things we've actually talked about, yeah. to see, uh, I want to see pastors uh, teaching the scriptures, expos doing expositional mm -hmm. preaching. You know, we, we talk about expositional preaching, but I know just from being around the country, it's actually pretty rare. Hmm. that the churches really truly have expositional preaching either pastors don't know how to do it so that's one reason mm -hmm. we train them or or some of them know how to do it and they actually don't think that's the way to grow a church mm -hmm. and 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 they're just wrong if they think that mm -hmm. because it, it 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 is the way to grow a, a church in a way that strengthens people to be christian so so i mean i teach at the seminary and i pastor and we have a lot of uh, students in our church who are going to be pastors and missionaries and and we want we believe that the church should be centered on the word be centered on the gospel if we preach the word we're going to preach the gospel the gospels uh, is is going to be uh, central thank you dr. Schreiner for coming on campus thank you for coming to minister to us even tonight for doing this interview it's, it's a real privilege to have you it's been great to be here Daniel and thank you for joining us. You can find more videos and audio at ni.edu slash heart conference. Thank you.